Welcome back once more, Canonites. Now that we've gone through the recent Halo Infinite tech preview in terms of reaction and feedback, we can dive into the juicy lore and Easter eggs present in the game so far. There were a surprising number in just this preview alone, which leaves me very excited for the final game. We'll start off with some of the stuff like AI and armors and whatnot, then move on to the maps in a part two. Do note that I won't be able to touch on literally everything from the flight, just stuff that I feel I can talk about in a meaningful manner, if that makes sense. Also keep in mind that all this info comes from a tech preview, so nothing is necessarily set in stone. I doubt much will change, but you never know. I've also included timestamps in the description, so y'all can jump around to any section you like and skip any that you don't. So with that, let's dive in. We'll start with the armor coatings available in Halo Infinite. Most feature rather simple names and descriptions, but a handful stood out. We first have Karaba Sirocco, more commonly referred to as the Gundam skin, as its color scheme is meant to model the classic RX-78-2, the original Gundam. The name of the skin is actually a double reference, though. Karaba was the name of a resistance group from the sequel series to the original Gundam, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam. Sirocco seems to come from Poptimus Skiroko, the main antagonist of Zeta Gundam, so you have one of the resistance groups and the main antagonist. A pretty cool reference, not gonna lie. The description simply reads, however, don't forget to write. I'm still not sure if this is a direct reference to something it feels like it is, but I never watched Zeta Gundam. When asking around on Twitter, Varen suggested that it could be referencing an infamous letter from the show, while Rigby Steele suggested that it could be a reference to the 08th mobile suit team from the show of the same name. In that show, one of the characters was regularly writing to his girlfriend. It isn't a perfect fit, but the 08th MS team is from the same continuity as Zeta Gundam, so that wouldn't be too far-fetched. Regardless, I love this coding, and it may end up being my go-to for the final game. If I could suggest one change, however, it would be include some red on the feet. Next up we have Hex and Slate, whose description reads, Humanity is ignorant of the miracles and secrets beneath their feet. The name and description obviously reference Zeta Halo, its current state, and the secrets it holds, secrets I imagine we'll uncover in the campaign. After that, we have Tahuna Sands. If it wasn't for the rogue sentinels and marauding banished, this could be an excellent vacation destination. Obviously, another reference to Zeta Halo and its current conflict. Tahuna, incidentally, is the Maori word for beach, so the coding is essentially named Beach Sand. Finally, we have Bleached Bone, whose description reads, in the end, the keelbugs conquer all. Keelbugs were actually a cut covenant species originally intended for Halo CE. The idea was that keelbugs would clean up the battlefield, flying in after battle, cutting up the bodies, and flying off with those parts. The idea was meant to be a clever way of cleaning up dead NPCs to free up memory, but the idea never made the cut. Here, though, the keelbug is reintroduced into the canon and seems to retain a version of its original purpose, cleaning up dead bodies. It's probably for the best that keelbugs never made it into Halo CE, but damn would it be cool to encounter them now. Before we move on, one thing you may have noticed so far is the manufacturer label next to each coating. While they all say UNSC here, we see some more variety later on. Though manufacturer names are nothing new to Halo, one thing I love about Infinite is that each name is accompanied by a company logo, which we haven't always gotten. And across the various items that we'll be covering, we'll see Imbrium Machine Complex, Emerson Tactical Systems, Hannibal Weapon Systems, RKD Group, Lethbridge Industrial, Beweglichkeit's Rüstung System, I know I butcher that and I'm gonna keep butchering it, I'm sorry, Chalab's Defense Solutions, Materials Group, Misria Armory, AMG Transport Dynamics, Optican, Korolev Heavy Industries, and interestingly, the UNSC is a separate manufacturer. I made a special note of the UNSC as a manufacturer because they usually have the Materials Group manufacture anything they need. The UNSC name does only seem to appear next to coatings, though, so it may just be for that. We'll touch on many of these companies as we go through the descriptions for other items, but I'll touch on a few here that don't directly come up later. First, we have Optican, a company that typically produces medical supplies and materials, such as Halo 3 ODST's health packs, and now a pair of medical unit attachments for Spartans. They were first mentioned in the audio drama Isle of Bees, though are best known from the aforementioned game. Second, we have Korolev Heavy Industries, a rather interesting company. They actually manufacture the Mermillion class Mjolnir armor that was designed by RKD Group. 
Mermillion was one of the Halo Online armors, and though its name still exists in lore, we currently have no canon depiction of said armor. In Halo Infinite, Korolev produces the UA-Type SA knee armor for Gen 3. Finally, there's Chalub's Defense Solutions. The original manufacturer of the M808 Scorpion, Chalub's lost the manufacturing rights to that and a couple Mjolnir variants in the post-war era, likely a result of reduced capacity as their headquarters on Meridian was hit during the war. They would go on to manufacture several Gen 2 Mjolnir armors, the Hydra, and the M820 Scorpion from Halo 5. However, the M808 in Halo Infinite is once again credited to Chalub's. I could talk about the Materials Group, Misria Armory, and AMG Transport Dynamics, but the easiest thing to say is that these companies are basically in control of most of the UNSC's manufacturing. The Materials Group mainly provides armor, Misria is primarily weapons, and AMG produces many of the UNSC's more common vehicles. That wraps up the armor coatings, bringing us next to helmets and attachments. Starting us out is the Enigma Helmet, an Imbrium machine complex creation that features state-of-the-art vehicle cyberlink technology. Intended for army tank crews, most of these helmets have been acquired by Spartans due to the cyberlink tech. The Enigma name of course comes from the term Enigma, meaning something difficult to understand, along with the infamous Enigma machine used by Nazis to encode messages during World War II. The inclusion of advanced technology seems to harken back to the Enigma machine. Imbrium Machine Complex manufactured several Mjolnir variants for Gen 2 and assisted in the construction of a few facilities, most notably Fathom Station. Enigma has one attachment at the moment, the FCI-I slash Proforma, one of several generation after next sensor systems produced as offshoots of Project Thea. While we don't know much about Project Thea at the moment, the project is named after the Greek Titan of Sight, a reasonable decision given that the project seems to produce new technologies based around threat detection and acquisition. Next up we have Emerson Tactical Systems' Cavallino Helmet, one we've already touched on actually. Tailored to the needs of fireteam leaders, trainers, and combat observers, Cavallino is both the name of a town in Italy and the Italian word for little horse. However, the name most likely references a magazine of the same name, one dedicated to Ferrari. I say this is the most likely as Grim Brother 1 once worked in racing and motorsports. Emerson also manufactures the Gen 2 Void Dancer armor and the MK50 sidekick. After that, we have Aviator from Hannibal Weapon Systems, a returning Gen 2 helmet updated now for Gen 3. The helmet features a high bandwidth machine interlink, one of many special features that tailor the helmet for use by cybernetically augmented aerospace pilots. Now, you may hear that and think only of Spartans, but pretty much every member of the UNSC is cybernetically augmented in some manner. Every UNSC recruit receives a standard neural interlace, which essentially just acts as an IFF tag and tracking device. More advanced versions can be installed based on need. For example, commanders, unsurprisingly, often have command neural interfaces, allowing them to more easily coordinate with AI and other command personnel. So basically, don't be too surprised if a pilot is seen with an aviator helmet, in the grand scheme of things at least. Hannibal Weapon Systems produces a number of Gen 2 Mjolnir armors, though is probably best known for its line of experimental vehicles in Halo 5. The company was founded by Jack Pilvros Hannibal on the colony of New Carthage. As revealed in the recent Halo Point of Light novel, Jack got lucky, stumbling upon a subterranean Forerunner complex which allowed him to manufacture incredible new technologies. We next have the new Trailblazer helmet, also from Ebrium Machine Complex. Based on the Recon Helmet, or Mjolnir R, Trailblazer is built on past successes to pioneer integration of the latest in forward observation and reconnaissance visor systems into a Spartan-friendly package. It's still rather odd that some returning helmets are being fully renamed like this, but I imagine that's largely for marketing purposes, to differentiate the newer stuff from the older, at least where it crosses over with Gen 1. Trailblazer also features an attachment the FCI-I slash Airwolf, the latest in counter-stealth sensor technology. Apparently, most of its capabilities require extensive offline analysis though, so I guess it's still in development to some degree. I love the look of the attachment though. Finally, we have Zvezda, another name that should sound familiar. When it was first revealed, I had actually thought that Zvezda was just the name of a faceplate, but it seems it's the name of the entire helmet. 
Developed by RKD Group, the Zvezda features a new faceplate that incorporates a programmable phased array antenna grid, or a grid of antenna that creates a radio beam that can be electronically directed without moving the actual antennas. So far, taking full advantage of this has been a challenge for software developers. RKD Group, by the way, developed the Hayabusa armor in cooperation with the Materials Group, along with a few other Mjolnir armors. Like the armor they're best known for, RKD's name may be a reference to the Ninja Gaiden series, originally known as Ninja Ryukenden. RKD could then be an abbreviation of Ryukenden. Zvezda also comes with an attachment, the TAS slash Droktulf, another result of Project Thea adjacent technology. This attachment uses said technology to reduce the bulk and complexity of external target acquisition systems. To me, this sounds like a subtle joke about all the scopes on Linda's Argus helmet. It'd be kind of funny too, if this same attachment was available for whatever armor Linda is now using. Zvezda and its attachment are both rather weird when it comes to their names. Zvezda is a feminine name of Slavic and Russian origin meaning star, which does kind of fit with the Zvezda faceplate. Arrays of antenna are one method to observe stars. Speaking of, there's also a Zvezda named module on the International Space Station. As for Droktulf, that seems to be named after a Byzantine general of Germanic origin in the 6th century CE. I'm honestly not sure what the connection with the attachment is though. I looked through as many sources as Google could give me, but nothing really clicked. If you have any ideas, let me know in the comments below. From there, we move on to the visors available in the flight. An interesting handful, I must say. Incidentally, all of these were manufactured by Lethbridge Industrial, a company named after Lethbridge, Alberta, a city in Canada home to Dan Greenskull Hamill and Jeff Wood, both prominent Halo fans. First up, we have the Golden Vandal Visor. An open space means open minds if you don't spot the snipers. Not much to say here, I just really love the dark humor of the description. Next, we have Goblin, an appropriately green visor given modern interpretations of the creature. Tricksters are wise to hide their eyes. The description seems to have been inspired by Hobgoblins, a mythological spirit of the hearth in British folklore. Originally considered helpful, it was re-envisioned as something more mischievous as Christianity began to spread through the land. After that, we have the purplish Phalanx Visor, with shield and spear vigilant. The name is obviously taken from the military formation, the term popularly associated with ancient Greeks and Romans. It's interesting that the visor is more of a purple color, as purple was very expensive and considered a sign of wealth. Only the Emperor, Praetorian Guards, and the like could afford it. Next up we have the Red Dragoon Visor, a favorite of Skyborn Lancers. This one is rather interesting as a Dragoon is an old type of mounted infantry. Dragoons could use horses for mobility, but they would dismount to fight, and were usually armed with firearms. Lancers, however, were cavalry armed with lance weapons, thus unlikely to dismount in battle unless forced off their horse. Despite this seeming contradiction, both Dragoon and Lancer can be used in modern day to refer to armored units, which is likely the intended reference. So, the Dragoon visor is favored among airborne armor units. Following that, we have the orange-red Rampant visor, the color of despair and madness. I doubt I have to explain too much, the visor is named after rampancy, the final stage of an AI's life, where it will begin to deteriorate. AI experiencing rampancy often turn red when rampancy is in full swing. What's particularly interesting about this visor is that it exists in Halo 5, though in there it's produced by Beweglichkeit Rüstungssystem, with the hopes that it would make them the de facto standard for integration with Forerunner sensor systems. Finally, we have Beltane, probably the most unique looking visor from the preview. Light the Bonfire of Freedom. Beltane is a Gaelic holiday, one of four seasonal festivals, and as you might have guessed, involves huge bonfires. Looking at the visor again, I can sort of see a fire-inspired look to the colors, making the reflection almost look like a bonfire. It's a pretty neat effect, I won't lie. We next move over to chest attachments, which had a few interesting pieces. First is the util slash enav beacon from Emerson, an emergency navigational transponder compatible with any and all civil and military networks. Pretty straightforward. Second is the UA slash M557 jackplate from, and I'm going to butcher this, the Viglikites Rüstungssystem, an up-armored module for Spartans engaging in breaching in urban warfare. The jackplate name comes from the historical Jack of Plate armor, an armor made up of tiny iron plates sewn between layers of felt and canvas, 
essentially a medieval version of the bulletproof vest. The UAM-57 seems to take inspiration from the Jack of Plates lighter weight and maneuverability, providing additional protection without restricting a user's movements. The Viglikite produced a few Mjolnir armors from both Gen 1 and Gen 2. Our third chest piece is another Baviglikite production, the UA-550D Halfplate, another up-armored module designed for minimal impact on mobility. The name is pretty self-explanatory, the armor attachment providing additional protection to the upper body, but little else. All the speed and only half the protection. Our fourth attachment comes from Ibrium Machine Complex, the Util-Chill-Pack cooling unit, meant to extend operational time in high-temperature environments. I'm not really sure if I pronounced this one correctly, I couldn't find anything on what chill pack means. I can only imagine it's a stylized version of chill pack, at which point I have to ask why the addition of cooling unit to the name. Who knows though. Our fifth and final chest attachment is the UA Relict Queerass, produced by Varaka Gessen BH, a reinforcement set made to specific requirements for Spartan containment teams. A Queerass is a piece of armor made from one or multiple plates of metal meant to cover the torso. Interestingly though, Aquarius usually protects both the front and back of the torso. The other half of the name, Relict, refers to a type of explosive reactive armor used by Russian military. Reactive armor is meant to reduce the damage received from a weapon or explosive. The only real mystery surrounding this armor is what exactly Spartans are using it to contain. Is it a subtle nod to flood containment? Does it refer to the general act of containing hazardous materials or locations? Or is it about containing potential threats? Though Varaka Gessen BH is a recently introduced company, its history stretches back to the days of the insurrection. Varaka produced the VK-78 Commando and were supplying it to the Colonial Military Administration by 2495. Given this, I wonder if the UA Relic Quiris was meant for containing civilians and insurrectionists. Our next items on the chopping block are weapon coatings. Though we only got a few in the tech preview, they were rather interesting. First, we have Maltese Mayhem, an obvious reference to the movie The Maltese Falcon, and generally a reference to old black and white film noir. The description, here's looking at you Spartan, is a reference to 1942's Casablanca. We next have Glass Hound. This one took some sleuthing, but I finally figured out what it's referencing, Game of Thrones, specifically Season 4, when the Hound and Arya are on the run. In this scene, Sandor the Hound Clegane asks repeatedly for Chicken, having just recently abandoned his duty to the crown. That brings us perfectly to the description, Disregard Monarchy, Acquire Chicken. An apt and perfect play on Reject Modernity, Embrace Tradition. The final coding we'll discuss is Crimson Skied, whose description reads, Hardware representing limitless potential for victory. This of course references Crimson Skies, a game series that eventually came to Xbox in 2003 with Crimson Skies High Road to Revenge. Much like Halo years before, Microsoft worked with Delray Publishing to release an official tie-in book that featured three short stories. Of these, one was written by Eric Nyland and the other by Eric Troutman. Nyland should be a more than familiar name, but Troutman is one of the unsung heroes of the Halo franchise. Troutman helped push for the Halo novels, helped write a ton of dialogue for the first Halo game, and helped develop the idea of ODSTs. If you enjoyed their inclusion in Halo 2 and beyond, you have Troutman to thank for that. Wrapping up this first half of our video, we'll be a look at the currently known personal AI and the colors available to them. First, we have my main man, Fret. Trained on centuries of battle reports and simulations in order to discern underlying patterns, Fret AI are able to remain eager to tackle the task ahead, despite the chaotic nature of wartime engagements. While there's not too much to say about the description, Fret's design is very similar to the superintendent AI from the fan comic A Fistful of Arrows. I wouldn't be surprised if that was on purpose. Fret is voiced by Robbie Damon. Let's just try our best not to get killed, okay? A voice actor who has played several roles across franchises, including Tuxedo Mask from Sailor Moon and Peter Parker and Spider-Man in various Marvel games and shows. Our next AI is Butler. Based on the core logic foundations of a key Oni asset, Butler AI are always available, always alert, always ready to clean up a messy battlefield symbological overlay. You have my full confidence, Spartan. Between the description and the AI's British accent, I'm all but certain that Butler is based on Black Box or BB, both in-universe and in real life. 
For anyone who may not know, BB was a fourth generation smart AI created from the brain of Dr. Graham Albin, an ONI researcher who helped with the Spartan 2 program. The guilt over his involvement led to his suicide in 2532. Conscious of the need for a smart AI, Dr. Albin killed himself in such a way to ensure his brain would remain undamaged, allowing it to be recovered and eventually used to create Black Box. Black Box was nearing the end of his life when Cortana's uprising occurred, the AI being six years old at the time, only one year away from the typical onset of rampancy. When the uprising came, he sealed himself and a few other valuable Oni AI away, entrusting his and their fates to the commander-in-chief of Oni, Saren Osman. Seems that since then, Black Box was at least used to create, or help create, the Butler AI. In the Hunt the Truth audio drama, Black Box was played by English actor Peter Serafonowicz. Our next AI is Cirque. Far more personable than any non-volitional dumb AI has any right to be, Cirque AI assistants have an impressively deep array of interface options to customize its interactions. Cirque seems to be something of a traditional secretary in terms of her personality. She is voiced by Carrie Walgren, Okie dokie! An absolute legend of a voice actress. She's voiced Haruko Haruhara from Fooly Cooly, Robin Senna from Witch Hunter Robin, Saya and Diva from Blood Plus, and Selty Sturluson from Durarara, among so many other voices, and those are just her anime roles, don't get me started on Western animation. Interestingly though, she's also done voice work for Halo before. Kari previously played Janissary Jan James, one of the main characters from the I Love Bees audio drama, and a system voice in both Halo 4 and Halo 5. Finally, for now at least, we have Lumu. Lumu constructs share a common situational calculus core with AI used in the fields of finance, providing a distinctive cost-benefit approach to decision-making assistance. That being said, they aren't quite as fun at parties. Basically, an accountant bot with all the drawbacks. I bet she would love Cones of Dunshire. Lumu is voiced by Erika Ishii. Hello, new best friend. Who is probably best known for lending her voice to Anna Bray in Destiny 2 and Valkyrie in Apex Legends. Now, let's tackle the AI colors, briefly. As several of the AI color choices in the recent flight were bugged, who needs three versions of orange? I'll be using footage from the last flight for the most part. Our first color is lightish red, a reference to the web series Red vs. Blue and the character of Donut, who would never admit to wearing pink armor. Look at it! It's not pink! It's like, a uh, a lightish red. Next, we have Bloodhand. A bright red, the description notes that Non-volitional AI cannot go rampant, but it can suffer from cascade errors. So, we have another rampancy reference in the color, though as the description notes, personal AI, a type of dumb AI, are not susceptible to the process of rampancy like smart AI. Calling the color Bloodhand is a little odd, but I suppose they couldn't reuse rampant since that's already a visor color. Bloodhand, though, just sounds very sung Healy, so again, odd name. Next, we have Ecumene Blue, the classic Forerunner Blue, Ecumen here is a reference to the Ecumen Council that governed Forerunner society. After that is Eridanus Sunset, another oddity. I say it's odd because the name is a reference to a sunset, though sunsets aren't usually green. That said, Eridanus II was the planet where the Master Chief, John 117, was from, so the color is a reference to the Chief himself. The color is also said to be licensed by Ohana Prescient Systems, and boy do we need to talk about this. First of all, this is just so appropriate since Ohana is the Hawaiian word for family. There's something kind of heartwarming about a company with that name licensing Eridana Sunset, the color itself referencing the Master Chief's home where his original family lived. Diving into the lore, however, Ohana Prescient Systems first appeared in the Halo graphic novel on page 122, the page documenting a young Avery Johnson's assassination of an insurrectionist leader. Ohana produced the Atlas Plus system for the M99 stanchion rifle used by Johnson, and would go on to manufacture the Artemis tracking system from Halo 5. Both appropriate products given the use of prescient, meaning to have knowledge of something before it happens, in the company name. Finally, we have Promethean, obviously a reference to the Prometheans and their love of orange. If you're going to lose a war to a galaxy-devouring parasite, you might as well look good. I couldn't agree more. Well, that wraps up this first half of our dive into the Easter eggs and lore of Halo Infinite's tech preview. Next time, we'll be looking at the lore and Easter eggs present on a handful of maps that we had access to. That will be out on YouTube in a few days, but my patrons can watch the full part two right now over on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a patron, stick around for the shout out in a moment or check out the link in the description box below. 
Until next time though, this has been Halo Cannon. First off, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horospice patrons. First, there's Hope, then we have Freight, Discombobulated Sycophant, Justin Montgomery, Ada Frame, Man in the Dark, Keisha Dila, Daddy Anarchy, and finally, Great Scott Productions. Thank you all for your amazing support of the channel. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halocanon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits such as behind the scenes materials, including raw audio for upcoming videos, or even shout outs like this. All patrons now get early access to certain videos as well, and more benefits are to come. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. If you really enjoy this, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.